Glenn Cashman. Welcome to Jazz Live San Diego. Thank you, Vince. Glad to be here. Uh, tell us a little bit about the band that you've got playing with you tonight. Well, we have some wonderful musicians. We have uh, Tom Rainier on piano, uh, Luther Hughes on bass, and Kendall Kay on drums. Uh, Tom, in addition to being a superb pianist, the ranger is also a very fine clarinetist and a saxophone player. And uh, you might see him on Dancing with the Stars playing piano when he does a lot of the arrangements. Uh, Luther, of course, has his own several bands, including the band that I play in the Cannibal Coltrane Project. And um, Kendall Kay is a very, very busy drummer around L.A. and um, it tours here and there with various musicians, including um, going on the road with Jack Jones, I think, from time to time. And uh, you're based uh, out of Los Angeles, correct? When I am out in, S in Southern California, I'm, uh, I'm around the Los Angeles area. Yeah. And is this a uh, band that you play with often when you're here? Well, we, we play as often as we can, and we play together in different configurations. And um, we haven't taken this particular project into the studio, but that would be a, something to consider for the very near future. So uh, tell us a little bit about, then, uh, your life uh, by Coastal. You also um, are uh, an associate professor of music at Colgate University. Still there? Still at Colgate University. Um, I try to come out to Southern California about four months a year summer semester breaks and um, spend time in uh, Riverside County where I have a house out in Lake Elsinore, very fortunate there. I um, was a director of jazz studies at Cal State Fullerton for a couple of years, 1999-2001. Oh. That was kind of how I got out to California and, and made some very nice connections, made wonderful people, wonderful musicians, and things just kind of snowballed out here. And so the so the reason for coming out here is uh, is for working, uh, doing, playing music, and uh, more so than your educational side. Uh, the other part of the year, pretty much leave that behind. All of, uh, occasionally there are some clinics and things going on out here, but uh, mostly I'm out here to, to write and perform. And I'm involved as artistic director of um, a jazz festival in Fullerton at the Mo Muckenthaler Cultural Center, and we do a six event jazz series there, mid May through June on Thursday nights. Oh, so that would be a, a good reason for you to be out if you were uh, curating that and, uh, and being involved in that. Do you get to play in that uh, series? My, uh, my nine-piece group closes that series, and I'm on hand for the other performances. And occasionally, if invited to sit in, we'll gladly do so. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. tell us a little bit about that nine-piece group. Is that the Southland Big Band? Well, we've... Um, the Nonette, I guess, It is now actually. the Southland Nonette. We did release that album, the Southland Big Band. Um, it's a lot easier to book nine pieces, as it turns out, than 14. <laughs> oh. No surprise there <laughs> but um, it's actually kind of nice it's a very transparent sound with the nine pieces and gives everybody a chance to play and still gives you plenty of room as an arranger to uh, express yourself um, uh, I was reading a review uh, by uh, William Ruhlman in allmusic.com about the, the Southland big band disc and um, and goes on to say uh, they earn the exclamation mark that appears at the end of the name and the album title and their academic qualifications notwithstanding, which we've already heard some about, present a lively and sometimes even hot set. Uh, how, how did you feel about that disc? Uh, that was your kind of debut uh, with this band, right? Yes. Um, you know, that was a lot of work. It's always a labor of love, especially when you start writing the pieces, then arranging the works. Um, rehearsing the band, getting some gigs for the band to get it familiar with the material and then you go into the studio of course and record the basic tracks and then the mixing can be a very large process with the with 14 pieces or more mm -hmm. um, but with the wonderful musicians on on board uh, it certainly was well worth all of that. Uh, the, the, the repertoire on that disc uh, was fairly wide-ranging and I'm wondering if that uh, is a kind of a reflection on you and some of the very different things. Uh, samba influenced work, uh, third stream-ish kind of stuff. Um, does that uh, does it kind of reflect you as, a, as an artist, a musician? Um, I'd like to think so. Um, I certainly have a love of the music of Brazil in addition to straight ahead jazz. Um, I did uh, earn a doctorate in um, new music, so kind of classical, contemporary classical music. Um, so there were some influences there that found their way in. Um, so hopefully we don't get pegged into any one particular genre and, and can cover a lot of things that people will enjoy listening to as well. Mm -hmm. So how does that uh, new music uh, play into, into jazz? Uh, are you bringing some things over from some of that classical side into jazz? I think I've tried to let myself be free to bring in um, some, uh, 
structures uh, and some rhythmic ideas that maybe I, I wouldn't normally have brought in had I not had those experiences in, 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 in being exposed to some of that music. Um, maybe just being free and allowing um, not to get stuck in a particular set of chord progressions and maybe using a little more dissonance than than uh, I might normally have or what might be in, in traditional straight ahead big band you might not do. But. Well, um, tell us a little bit about then uh, about your your work in jazz education. Uh, as we said, you're at Colgate University. What are some of your responsibilities there? Well, I just finished a three-year term as department chairperson, which was uh, my first time doing that. So that was a whole lot of skills uh, one has to kind of brush up or learn that you don't normally have as a musician, nor do you necessarily want to have. But it was a very good experience, and um, so. And aside from that, I, I essentially teach jazz courses there. I run the jazz ensemble, um, jazz theory arranging, private private saxophone lessons, uh, private composition on occasion, and uh, when needed, I might teach a, a harmony course or a, even sometimes a general music history course if, if they're really stuck. <laughs> <laughs> um, the jazz program there is it part of a, a broader music program? How does uh, jazz fit into the musical program uh, the, uh, at Colgate? Well, unlike um, a couple of other universities I've taught at, which includes Cal State Fullerton and Towson University in Baltimore, which were large state schools with large music programs, Colgate is a small private school. And so most of the students are not going on to have a career in music, uh, but some of them are very talented and they want to continue having those experiences, but not necessarily make it their life's work. So it's a little different mission than I've had, but it's very rewarding and the students are very knowledgeable and I think we're also training a new audience, an educated audience, which we certainly need. Mm -hmm. Well, um, how did you get introduced to music, kind of going way back, and uh, maybe we'll find and make this connection uh, to jazz education, but how did you get introduced to music in the beginning? Uh, for some reason, I nagged my parents for an entire year when I was seven about taking piano lessons, and they finally um, came up with uh, an old player piano, which my father took the guts out of it which I don't think it was working anymore and from the player piano standpoint and I started taking piano lessons and um, in the fifth grade I started playing clarinet and saxophone in the ninth grade and um, just in ninth grade was when I think I got interested in jazz uh, in, in high school. Was there, uh, was there anything that you can remember that uh, gave you that drive to pick up uh, not just one but uh, multiple instruments? Uh, what was it about music? Was there a lot of music in your household uh, growing up? Well, my dad uh, played music by ear. He played the push-button accordion, so I kind of grew up hearing uh, American folk songs like I've been working on the railroad and others wafting out of the basement. And mm -hmm. I think that's, um, that's you know, his side of the family was, was musical. And he had a brother who was a, played saxophone on the side who lived out in Whittier, California, as a matter of fact. So, um, so I, maybe it was somewhat genetic. I'm not sure there. <laughs> so then, uh, how did uh, jazz music come in uh, into your life? Well, as part of entering high school, um, we were in the marching band, and the students said, "Oh, you know, try out for the jazz ensemble." And I remember playing the the, the audition was playing the um, solely saxophone solely from the stock arrangement of Bluesette, was which was actually kind of a hip chart. And I just worked and worked and took private lessons and studied and studied and got in the band. And one thing led to another. And we had a very evolved program in high school. The directors were very sensitive to students who were more interested in, in and maybe had more of a future going forward in music. And I was able to write music for the concert band, uh, the wind ensemble with jazz ensemble. And they were very progressive in that way and give, providing opportunity. So you were uh, writing music then uh, pretty early on in your uh, in your studies. I, th I think I would say for at least ninth or ninth or tenth grade, I was starting to conceive of um, write, you know writing for for small group and then these larger pieces by eleventh grade. Mm -hmm. Were you listening to uh, some uh, larger ensembles that uh, maybe gave you some uh, cues or hints of kind of what you wanted to do? Well, in high school, you know, of course, you were exposed to Maynard Ferguson uh, at that time. That was certainly one of the bands that everybody listened to, and Buddy Rich. Um, there was a Phil Woods album called Round Trip, which had some wonderful arrangements, and, and I can't remember who the arranger was on that, maybe uh, Marty Page. Um, so, plus Count Basie, Duke Ellington. Mm -hmm. Um, you, uh, I was reading that you were influenced by uh, John Coltrane. Uh, it's kind of 
kind of some, somewhat obvious, but it's always interesting to hear the story of how, uh, how that came into your life and, and what was uh, so special about that for you. Well, before Coltrane, I should really say that I heard Stanley Turrentine and uh, something about his sound and style just really grabbed me. And when I first heard Coltrane's A Love Supreme, I really didn't like it because I didn't understand it and subsequently it became one of my favorite albums. Uh, but I think as the students that were more interested in high school in music and in college, as we all kind of gathered together and shared ideas, somebody would be in a practice room and, or you'd be in a room and someone would come in, hey, what are you working on? And oh, I'm working on this. And you go into their room and they've got a solo they're working on. You gradually, I think, learn more that way than you might in a just in, in even in, then in a very organized curriculum from a kind of a pure exchange. Mm -hmm. So you sort of weed out what you like and you don't like and of course over the years you change um, to a certain extent as you grow musically and understand you, you can hear things that you couldn't hear before and, and things that you didn't like or didn't understand they, they really, you really embrace them later on. Mm -hmm. Um, tell us a little bit about your work with uh, Luther Hughes and the Cannonball Coltrane Project. How'd you get involved in that? Because that's well, a uh, band that has, uh, I think, four albums out and, uh, and has done very well yes. uh, with those. Um, when I was teaching at Cal State Fullerton, uh, Luther was the, the bass instructor there, and I think that's how we first became acquainted. And um, he was, we were sitting around one day, and he said, oh, wouldn't it be great to put together a group to play those arrangements from that um, 1958 or 59 album that was Cannonball Coltrane. It was basically Miles Davis group without Miles Davis. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we put together uh, some musicians and said we're going to I think the first gig was at Kikuya, which was a Japanese restaurant that had jazz in Huntington Beach. So we all learned our parts off the record, wrote out our own little sheets. We played this gig and, and it just went fantastically well. And so we just kind of kept going with that, and very soon after that we got a call from the um, Orange County uh, Performing Arts Center to play, and we realized, well, we can't just keep playing all the cover tunes from that CD. We've kind of got to branch off into some other things, so we started writing a real originals in the style of, or influenced by this particular tune, or associated with Coltrane, Cannonball, so forth. Um, you have a San Diego connection, uh, a bit of a San Diego connection, with uh, Holly Hoffman and Mike Wofford, uh, who have recorded uh, your music. Tell us a little bit about how that uh, came to be. Well, it's hard to remember now how we all met, and I'm thinking it's probably somehow through the Cannonball Coltrane Project mm -hmm. and coming down to San Diego to play at some point, maybe six, seven years ago, uh, I met Holly and Mike, and they've become dear friends, um, and I've had them both uh, at back east to perform and work with my students there, and, and they're also wonderful educators as well, wonderful performers. Um, one of the tunes that I had written that was recorded by the Cannonball Coltrane Project was influenced by um, Mercy, 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 as written by Joe Zawinul, recorded by Cannonball Adderley, and it was, this piece was called No Mercy, but it kind of had that similar gospel vibe to it, and Holly heard it and just thought it would work well for their their duo and and they recorded that and I'm very grateful and humbled about that. So, um, so tell us a little bit about what you've got uh, planned for the future. I guess uh, are you in the middle of this series uh, up uh, in Fullerton? Well we finished that at the end of June. Mm -hmm. um, the Nonet looks like the Nonet will record this fall a Ooh. CD so I'm looking forward to that. Um, I think I'm also going to be working on some Material. I, I would like to put together a group to play Brazilian music. I sort of don't get quite enough of my fill the, uh, um, of that otherwise. Mm -hmm. So, uh, any particular uh, things you're reaching for uh, in your music? Uh, experimenting, you know, new writing styles or things that you're hearing that you want to incorporate? Uh, well, I think. Um, I'm trying to work on more philosophical things and about just in certain ways kind of freeing one's mind uh, to be in more in the moment and, and more in a greater sense of relaxation uh, while continuing to add vocabulary for improvisational uh, reasons but I, I think it's more important to sort of plug into what's going on at that moment with the particular musicians you are rather than trying to superimpose your own thing on the situation and, right. and try to be more uh, more of a free-flowing, more fluidity in it. Has that been a challenge for you in the past? Well, I think it's always a challenge to be completely relaxed. Right. Um, and 
uh, you know, we've been very blessed to play with such, such wonderful mus musicians in Southern California and other places. But still, to, for the music to feel naturally and or natural and organic, which is really a, one of my goals, you, you really have to um, be be free in that in that moment and listen and react. Well, uh, can you tell folks where they can find out more information about you, Glenn? You can go to glencashman.com, and you might also find me on Facebook somewhere. Excellent. Well, uh, Glenn, uh, it's great to have you here. Uh, best of luck in the future and all you got going on, and uh, and uh, congratulations on uh, on everything. Thank you so much, Vince. Really appreciate it. All right, Glenn. I'm gonna